Quality matters. People are not comparing your learning or corporate video to the last learning or corporate video that they saw. They're comparing your video content to other media. They're comparing your video content to what they saw on TikTok, the video game they just played, to the movie they just watched. And we all need to develop the skills for the videos within our venue to stand up against other media that's out there. Otherwise, we're going to turn off viewers and, and we're going to disengage the people who we need to be uh, engaged in what we're doing. So I think quality matters, production quality matters, but all of it can be learned. There's no talent here. Now is your time. If you've been standing on the sidelines waiting to record that first video or get into video production, now is the time because the way that tools are headed, it's gonna get easier. The way that the equipment is headed, it's gonna get easier. So um, I would challenge your viewers, especially if they're interested in view and they're watching this right now, just get started. Uh, pick a small project, get out there, get your hands dirty uh, with a lot, as Matt mentioned, a lot of free tools are out there at your disposal and it is the best time the best time to get in the video. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are and wherever you're watching from, you're listening to The Visual Lounge where we talk about using images and video in the workplace. And today's show, we're gonna be talking with two expert video producers. They create videos for learning content and other reasons that they have for creating video. They've done it a ton. We're gonna be getting some of their expertise, some of their insights, some of their forecasting for the future. We're gonna do a little bit of everything today. So let's go ahead and jump right in with my guests, Mark Lassoff and Josh Cavalier. So let's do quick introductions. You've probably met them before because they've been on the show. Mark Lassoff, CEO of the Tech Learning Network, is a prominent figure in digital learning, having trained over 2 million people in coding and design. He's a pioneer in new media learning and his company produces high quality learning content. Mark is a well-respected speaker and author and has received numerous awards, including the Learning Guild Guildmaster Award for his contributions to the field. He's a he is dedicated to helping individuals and organizations stay ahead in digital skills and career development. And with us also is Josh Cavalier, who is an experienced and passionate learning and development professional with over 25 years of experience in the field. He's an expert in creative, he's an expert in creating instructional videos and is dedicated to sharing his extensive knowledge with others. He's got a proven track record of delivering successful video workshops for some of the world's leading companies including Microsoft, Lockheed Martin, Marriott, Lowe's, and Pfizer. He's a regular speaker at industry conferences and is well-respected in the learning and development community. And with that said, let me welcome Josh and Mark. Welcome to the Visual Lounge. Hey, Matt. It's a lot Hello. to read, you know, when, when I know you so well, but... <laughs> I'm gonna truncate that somehow. Yeah, you know, we'll talk about this in later, but I'll tell you how I actually got to the final copy there. Uh, but before we do that, I want to start someplace uh, that I think help people relate to you guys. You've both been on the show before. You're both experts in video. Let's start here, though. A little bit of a fun question. Tell me about the first video you ever made. Like, from a, it could be for learning purposes or just video you made. And and what was it that made that stick with you guys into wanting to create video? Because I think, I think first videos are often instructive. So, Josh, first, first go, video. Go no, go ahead, Mark. You got one? Yeah, the first video I made, I was 14 at Staples High School in Connecticut, and I took a course called TV Production, and I had to make a one-minute commercial. Um, I don't remember what the commercial was for. I can tell you it wasn't very good, and we recorded it on three-quarter-inch videotape. <laughs> Um, but if you count that as my first video, then I have 34, exper 34 years' experience in the video field. <laughs> there we go, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, I'll just jump in with my some of my first early experiences with video was in school as well, but I never thought of it as making video. We did the like the TV, the the news for the school, uh, like on the TV, and it was there's no real editing. It was just kind of live to tape, and you rolled it, and it was it was good. But uh, what about you, Josh? First video experience. I mean, really, the first experience was just taping things on a VCR. <laughs> but, <laughs> but professionally, uh, it was the actual 160 by 120 pixel video uh, for CD-ROM delivery. Uh, 1X CD-ROM, one of the first multimedia 
jobs that I did back in 1995. So uh, that was that was a task because uh, there was bandwidth restrictions. There was you know capture. You had to go from analog to digital. Uh, it was uh, it was a chore, to say the least, for a little little posted stamp of video. Yeah, I mean those restraints. So that's what you you learn to craft really good video around those constraints, right? Like we had at TechSmith when I started all these things that had to be true about your video before you could put it on the website. Like it had to be less than, and now this was a little bit later, but like four megabytes was the max. If it was right. really were in trouble if it was more than that because no one could watch it. I think professionally I did screencasts before I did video. The screencasts are a type of video, but yeah. before I did full fledged video, I was doing a lot of screencasts going back probably 20 years ago for some of the first online learning. Um, so that screencast recording for me came before I actually got to show my, my pretty face on the camera. Yeah, same, same. Screencasts are way to go. So, okay, so you guys have had this long breadth of experience. You've done tons of videos. I mean, I would hate to even try to venture a guess on the number of videos the three of us have created across our careers. It's probably a lot. Mark seems to roll out videos all the time, so I can only imagine how many he's done. But today what I want to do is I want to treat this as kind of a forum between the three of us to talk about some, you know, some best practices, things that help well, maybe help the listeners to, to get better. One thing I want to tease here a little bit is that we do have a, a, a workshop we'll talk about that there's some opportunity if you want to come and learn more. But let's start kind of foundationally. You know, there there's so many things that I think happen now with video. We, we don't even think about these constraints. But what what is what is something that we should everyone who's making a video today for whatever purpose, what's something that they need to know that maybe they overlook? Is there anything that's, you know, you'd hope it'd be obvious, but maybe it's not that we should just know to get started. I'll start. Yeah, Josh. Uh, I, I know that, you know, for a lot of my career, I was just really focused in on just the training video. And what I mean by that is like knowledge, skills, behavior, experiences, and, and just that moment. And then as my career progressed, then I realized that it's much more of a journey. And so, especially nowadays, you really have to gain attention. You have to prepare uh, the viewer for the experience. You have to go ahead and build optimal uh, videos for transfer. You have to reinforce afterwards. You have to go ahead and do performance support. And so, you know, where I was kind of pigeonholed into a one type of video early in my career, uh, as I expanded, I realized that there's like five or six different types of videos to actually have the whole entire experience uh, laid out for somebody who's going through that that journey. Yeah, so so you got to think about more than just there's not just a how to video that to be made. There's other other types, and we'll, we we should talk about this in a minute. Mark, anything you would add to what Josh said about what do people need to know? Yeah, I mean, I'll go a little bit of a different direction with it. Yeah. And, you know, the power that you have in a handheld device is better than anything that was available 15 years ago, even at the high end. So the power you have to make really, really good video without spending a lot of extra money is right in the palm of your hand. The thing that I like to say about video pretty frequently is that it's a skill, not a talent. And everything that I do with years of experience, everything Josh does, everything that Matt does can be learned. There's no inherent talent like painting or drawing needed. Anyone can become a really good video producer. And with the current state of technology, you don't have to spend a lot of money to do so. And I think people overlook that because the first question I often get is what type of camera should I buy? And, you know, where do I, you know, where do I get this editing? And you don't need a lot of that to produce really good video. And if you look at some of the top um, media people who now nowadays are on YouTube, um, some of them produce with fairly bare bones production um, and, you know, really use minimal uh, tooling in order to get a really, really good result that loads of people watch. So interesting that you bring that up. I, I spoke with someone today and I'll, I'll, I, because I haven't talked to him about this, I won't use names, but they are very successful on YouTube, over a million plus subscribers, and they're using free tools. I mean, they're they're literally using free tools to make their business work and be very successful and 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 grow. And so I I, I like that point, right? Like you, 
you gotta, you've got more than you need in, in your pocket with something like a, 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 a phone, right? Uh, right. But it's, well, it's, I, I, I'd skills. even take that one, I, I'd even take that one step further. I'll tell a real quick story. Um, years ago, you know, when we thought we had, we had hit, you know, pretty rapid success in the online course market. Um, and we thought we needed to equip our studios. So we bought a whole bunch of expensive production equipment. The problem is we didn't know how to use it. So we actually were making poorer quality video with the expensive equipment than we were when we were using, you know, cheap prosumer cameras from Best Buy. So, you know, sometimes it actually can be a drawback to have expensive equipment that's complex to use because the skill level required to use it, you know, it takes a while to achieve. So, you know, I mean, I think it's even at first a good thing to just use your phone or use an inexpensive logging camera because you're going to know how to use it and you're going to be able to create quality video with more automation than a lot of manual settings that you don't understand. Well, I think it goes to what Josh, you said earlier, right? Not being limited in the scope of what you do. So don't let the the gear limit you to not only what you do, but also having learning the techniques, learning the types of videos. That's right. I want to just, just you know, uh, continue what Mark was saying. I have challenged myself to only use my mobile phone for all my training videos I'm personally recording uh, this year. So there's no fancy cameras. Uh, I might have a couple stand lights here, uh, but everything that I'm going to be producing in 2023 is going to be off of a phone that can record in 8K. <laughs> so Mark nailed it. Like there's no barrier. If you have a smartphone, you're in. Yeah, I, I love I, it. I, th I, think, I think where the, you know, where the um, need for more expensive equipment comes is with volume. You know, when you're producing video at scale, at an enterprise level, and you're producing for a lot of hours a day, your phone's not built for that. And that's where you have to start looking at, you know, more uh, advanced equipment. Otherwise, your workflow is going to break down. But when you're getting started, there's no reason not to use your phone. And even later on, if your use case justifies it, your phone makes great video. Why not use it? Yeah. So I think we've established that. So the, the technology, the, the cameras, the, that, that stuff doesn't, it, that's not the secret sauce, right? That's not the secret to a good video. You can make a video with whatever you have. So if, if, you know, let's just be bold here and ask the question. So what is the secret sauce? What, what does someone need to be able to be successful? And, it, you know, I'm hearing a little bit, Josh, you're talking about breaking out and having kind of access to different types, but you, you've both been very successful in, in different areas of creating video. I mean, and I know I'm being naive here to, to say like there's a secret ingredient because I know there's not. It's like, you know, Kung Fu Panda, right? Like the secret ingredients is nothing. But but if you had to to kind of put your stake in the ground and say like, hey, here's something that I found works generally really well to make my video successful. Is there is there such a thing or is it truly there is no secret sauce? I don't know if it's a secret, but uh, well, it's have, not a secret. I, I would. I would have to say it's the viewer or the audience but completely and fully understanding who's going to be consuming your content and why and getting into their head and that really should drive everything that you do from a production standpoint at the end of the day it's they're the they're the ones that are going to be consuming it not you so uh you know we we take so much time in our production values and everything like that I mean, what environment are they going to be in and what frame of mind are they going to be in when they're watching the video? So uh, for me, the secret sauce is really the, the viewer, understanding the audience. Yeah. What about you, Mark? I, I, I would expand on that. I think understanding your viewer is part of a larger, well-planned, well-prescribed pre-production process. Uh, you know, I mean, every minute that we spend in pre-production spends us, you know, saves us four minutes in post-production and in our production. So planning your video well, having a process that you go through every time to do so, including defining that audience, the objectives for the video, and understanding the channel that your video is going to be um, distributed through. I mean, a perfect example is today, we've got a, a couple of major channels distributing vertical video, right? Video that's like this versus like this. And you know, years ago, that was unheard of. But that's something you've got to know during, you know, very early on in the process in order to be successful. So a good planning process is better than 
you know, almost anything else as far as being efficient when it comes to producing video. Our secret sauce is strictly all in planning. We don't do anything interesting in the production and post-production phases, but our planning I would put up against anybody's. And I think that's the reason that my team is successful is because our videos are so well planned according to a prescribed process that we use every time. Uh, yeah, so I, I love this, that this is the conversation because I think when I talk to people, I think a lot of people really want it to be the video production, right? Like, oh, there's something about doing certain things in the video production. But I think what you're, what I'm hearing and what I've experienced as well is that it's all that, that the stuff that sometimes isn't that fun to do, but like understanding the audience, understanding the message, understanding how to teach that message well, and getting that all laid out before you ever hit record will always make your end product better. And I have an example that I just, I just had to do an up company update. You know, we're, we're not a huge company, but every Monday we have a meeting and we do have share outs. And I just did a, a share out on how the podcast is going. Cause you know, people want to know what's, what's happening with it. And I didn't really plan it well. And I spent more time than I probably needed to trying to clean up and make it work than I would have if I just stopped and said, okay, let me, let me really do some work. And, and I think I'd add to what you said to both of what you said is like also just getting your assets together, like pulling, pulling the, everything you need that you can do before you ever hit record. So you have it all laid out. So when you get into edit mode, it's just, you're just bringing it together and, and it doesn't have to be super interesting or super creative either. Right? Like going back to YouTube, there are fun things and there are creative things and artistic things, but what does your audience really, what do they really need to see to learn, especially in a learning video to get from A to B to C, whatever it might be. Right. And, and often that's a question of the channel that you're going to be distributing on, right? Um, the user or viewer expectation is different on YouTube, on TikTok, or within a corporate learning management system. And understanding where your video is targeted is critical. And by the way, the same video doesn't work for all three of those use cases. You've got to be hyper aware, as Josh was saying earlier, of audience and distribution channel, because that's going to guide your pre-production process, the type of assets you're going to gather in pre-production. But I think, you know, the important thing to, to remember is, unfortunately, like most things in life, it's in the boring procedural types of elements that success is found not in kind of the sexier, you know, video shoots and lights and cameras and action. It's all in the pre-production where success is. It's the, it's the money ball of video creation, right? If anyone's read the book Moneyball or seen the movie, right? It's all in the stats and it's not the guys that hit the home runs. It's the guys that get on first base consistently. It's just, and that's not, that's not fun baseball. Well, I if, you're the Yan if you're the Yankees, it's the home runs. <laughs> <laughs> but that's probably why they were out in the first round of the playoffs. See, now you're already past my, my baseball knowledge, Mark. So, <laughs> so, so, okay. I think we've established some of the, 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 the good things here, but I want to start thinking about future, the future of video, because we're obviously in this tumultuous time where things are changing rapidly. You know, it, it, there's lots of technology that's come out. I mean, everything from the way video editors are working to, you know, obviously our, our devices have tons of different options for video. So if we're, we're taking it, let's take off our kind of like basic hat of like, here's what you need to do. What we know the secret sauce is in your pre-production, but as you put on your projection lenses of where we're going in 2023 and beyond, what's changing the game that's going to help you be successful going forward as video producers? Are there things that you've got your eye on that uh, you're considering or you are, are using, or you think will come up this year or next year that, you know, may change the game a little bit. Josh, I know you've got thoughts on this. I know. <laughs> you, you're just going to open up the can of worms, aren't you? Yep. I'm going to rip off yeah, the band -Aid. So, Yeah. So this, this week I have been posting on uh, LinkedIn about chat GPT and, you know, for me, it, it's fascinating to, to think that as creators, that we'll have tools on our hands that are just going to expedite the content creation process, not replace it. It will speed things up. And that means for me personally, more iterations, more time for exploration, more solid solutions. And it is almost at times eye-watering and breathtaking uh, what AI can produce both from a tech standpoint 
with with scripting and also from an image and even short five or to ten second video clips um what's happening in the marketplace so things are moving fast and i know that for all of us it'll have some type of impact uh in the long term for sure what do you think mark i AI? Underestimate. yeah i mean i wouldn't underestimate the power of ai it's an exciting um advance that we're seeing and we're seeing things move really rapidly right now but i also think that as the content itself becomes more commoditized because you know everyone can have ai produce now blog posts and scripts your production becomes more important. Your personality on camera becomes more important. Your ability to address the audience's needs directly become more important. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I teach in areas that are pretty commoditized, HTML, JavaScript, front end web, uh, you know, office suite. And there's a million people out there doing it. But I think what will set part successful people in the future are being good on camera, addressing an audience that understands you're there just for them. And also all of those factors that surround your video that aren't necessarily part of the production itself. You know, what do you provide along with the video? You know, video learning, which is, uh, you know, the area that Josh and I are in, you know, is shown to work really well when there's also community attached to it. And how do you run that community? How do you surround the learning? And, and as Josh talked about, you know, kind of that larger uh, learning process, that larger lifespan outside your video. I think it's just going to make all the other things that much more important. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure we're going to see a tectonic shift as much as we're going to see a, a gradual change to video being less about the singular video and more about the experience that surrounds the entire video program. Yeah, I, I think that's very insightful because I do think, you know, if, if it is commoditized, like as that anything gets commoditized, the other things become, you know, much more important. And it probably is a good time to start thinking about like, well, if I'm making videos for my organization, what is like already starting to assess? Like, what are we already providing? What is the community like? How do we interact? So I think that's that's a, a really good point. And, and I agree that I don't think we're going to see like this immediate, oh my gosh, it's here, we're done for. But I do think it, it, it has this potential. And Josh, I've been looking at your stuff that you've been posting on LinkedIn and thinking about like, well, how do I use this much like I would augment any of my other capabilities? You know, if I'm if I'm having a hard time hearing, can I augment my hearing with a hearing aid? Or if I if I have mobility issues, what can I do? Like, can I amplify what I'm capable of based on uh, what AI can provide you? And you know, it was interesting as an experiment. I I ran your bios. I took your bios that you had provided me in past for past episodes, and I asked the AI to rewrite them for me, and it did a pretty good job. And I mean, it's not that much different but it cleaned it up. It summarized a little bit. I asked it to provide some questions. Um, and it did, it did a few that were okay, but it, you know, it's like, it's uh, the garbage in garbage out mentality right now, right? Whatever I feed it is going to feed back some variation, but if I don't feed it, it doesn't know enough at this point, the model just doesn't know enough or, you know, to really give me full, full robustness, but it gets me started, which seems pretty interesting. Right. And I think what we need to fill in, I mean, look, why do we do anything like write blog posts, write stories, create videos? I mean, part of it is not just education, but also to express ourselves. And I don't think that's something we should cede completely to AI. AI provides us a starting point, but I've got to put my own stamp on it as an online instructor, as a teacher, as someone who's serving an audience, someone who's the steward of people's um, investment in my teaching. And that expectation doesn't go away. You know, AI can provide some basics, but in the end, it has to be my work. Otherwise, it's just another guy yammering on about HTML or, or, or what have you. So I, I think, you know, the level of personalization is going to have to increase and, and, you know, AI is not going to give us a full package because it is so dehumanized. And I, I put, I just did a post where I said, the last thing that you got to add is your soul is that you have to add that in. I, I was actually moment. plagiarizing. I was actually plagiarizing your post right then. <laughs> <That was crazy. laughs> you know, I, 
I was trying to play this out in my mind. And I know that our reality today, we must create optimal training or any kind of video content. And the reason why is if we play this out today, the inputs for mid journey and Dolly and all that are the static images of today going into a huge database. And the, and the next iteration will be all the videos, everything up on YouTube, everything that we personally produce, uh, either personally or for our companies. All of that is going to go into a database and someone's going to go ahead and go into a chat box and go, I need to brush up on XYZ skills or knowledge. And it's going to compile something together based upon the content we create today. We are the architects. We're the ones that are going to lay the foundation for all video content that's going to be pr produced by AI. So we have an opportunity to set that in, in motion. Uh, which I think is absolutely fascinating. It might take 20 years to get there, but today is the day. That's the reason why you need to learn to produce great videos. But I think too, you know, the danger of this, like other media has been, of being highly politicized and essentially spouting garbage from a particular point of view that may or may not be true, but its first goal is to be to adhere to that point of view is you know, going to be a real danger because AI is only going to reflect what we're feeding into it. And the level of discourse out there right now in video and social is pretty poor. So I think people are still going to have to be judicious and selective in this future about what they consume, perhaps even more so. And I agree with Josh, we have an exciting opportunity to architect that future. But with that also comes you know, a pretty big responsibility to provide this a these AI systems with information that's of high quality. That's true. Um, you know, I don't want to get political, but you know, it, the tendency to speak from a singular perspective is is not necessarily healthy. And these systems can be easily engineered to favor any number of perspectives, uh, you know, and not, not, you know, not necessarily a plurality of views that are out there. So, I mean, I think, you know, while I'm excited about the technology, I also approach with caution because we've been down this road. We were very excited about what social media can do. And we're starting to see pretty big downsides that are, uh, that are really impacting the overall experience. Now that I've inserted a giant bummer into the conversation, we can <laughs> No, well. I think I think it, it's the reality, right? And I think one thing that uh, I I want to just kind of put out there is that like I mean, it does for one, first of all, it feels like a lot like when social media was really starting to take off. Like I have that that feeling, like I haven't felt that in a long time about a technology, so it feels very similar and I think the risks are probably similar if not maybe even more. But I, I want to get back to something that Josh, you said about this, putting our soul into the work, right? If we're talking about a secret sauce, it feels like whether you're doing AI stuff or not, if you're making a video and it's not this human connection and it's just kind of like, here's the facts, boom, 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 that can work, that can teach somebody. But it feels like the humanity of, you know, like steward being that steward, as you mentioned, Mark, God, shepherding our learners is really important, whether you're on camera, it's a screencast, it's an animation, whatever type of video it is, feels like that has a really important value to whatever you're creating, whether, again, whether it's learning content, marketing content, you know, uh, you know, even entertainment, of course, that that's a whole big can of worms I don't want to go down, but like, it feels like you need that as part of your content some personality, some liveliness, or it's not going to really hit home. Maybe I'm wrong, but. Yeah. So I went ahead and, and did the whole workflow as far as generating learning objectives and doing a script and doing all that through chat G G GPT. And I was like, okay, let's go ahead and take into an AI video tool. So I've dumped it. I dumped the script into an AI video tool. I'm not going to mention which one. And it auto generated the video with stock videos and Okay, on the surface, does it tell a story? It does, but there is no craft. There is no continuity. There is no, um, you know, art to it. Uh, and it was just, it would fall flat. It, it was just like, it's robotically produced. And I, I think it's going to be a long road for AI developers even try to reproduce that level of creativity and continuity in video. 
Yeah, it's like when you see these synthetic uh, AI-based avatars, even just the voice. I can always tell there's something just off. There's something non-human about it. There's no soul. And watching those things, I think people really need to proceed with caution about overuse of anything that's AI generated because teaching to me is something that's so personal. You know, we all grew up going to schools and I think almost everyone has fond memories of, of teachers from the past and relationships that were built where learning was the catalyst to those relationships. I mean, all of my lifelong friends are from school. Um, and, you know, learning is a catalyst and school is a catalyst for so many things that our initial models of teaching are so human. And to dehumanize that, I think, is criminal, whether it's corporate learning or something you're putting on YouTube. And I think in the long run, people who over rely on AI and dehumanize the learning process, dehumanize their video, are going to pay a price for doing so because people are going to reject it, especially in a time where I think people are really starving for connection. Yeah, I, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if there was a future study about knowledge or learning retention in a video and AI bots or AI avatars. I, I'm going to I'm going to make a guess that the retention wouldn't be as high, <laughs> but we, we shall see. Well, not no. for me, because I'll turn it off. I mean, I you know, <laughs> I, I find the dehumanizing borderline offensive. You know, mostly because they think I'm stupid enough not to realize that it's AI. And I feel like when you use AI, you've, especially in a visual or audio form, you've got to be pretty upfront about it. You're not fooling anybody. Right. And if, if, if you think you are, um, I think, again, you know, your video is going to end up being rejected. I mean, it's so easy to click stop. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of the studies that we see and a lot of the information that were provided in the industry is based on people who watch the video and ignores all the people who got 30 seconds into the video and abandoned it. If you ever see YouTube statistics, that's a lot of people. We've got to be really, really careful about this new era. I think there's so much potential, but I also, again, think we've got to be skeptical and we've got to be cautious. Absolutely. Well, you know, we've talked a lot about the the role of being kind of in person in terms of like present and with our audience and teaching. Let's let's talk about something that we're doing real quick, because I think this is a great segue. Now that we bubbed everybody out who is excited about AI, we've confirmed everyone's fears. about it is, AI. It is exciting. It is exciting. <laughs> absolutely. No, it absolutely is. I want to talk about with you guys. Uh, the, an opportunity coming up. If you're listening to this right now and it's uh, after April, you might have to see if we're doing another one, but we are going to be doing a two day workshop with the learning guild. If you're not familiar with them, they put on a variety of conferences, one coming up in April called learning solutions. And we're doing a two day workshop on video creation. So high level guys, what, what if someone's listening to this and thinking, Oh, I like workshops and I want to learn more about making video. What, what could we expect that they'll learn? during the two days spent with the three of us, which might be a lot. People might be going like, no, Matt's too much. He's, he talks too much. So <laughs> They might learn some things they didn't want to learn. That's right. Um, <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, I, think, I think it's a two-day experiential boot camp for video producers, uh, you know, kind of favoring people who create videos that are educational in nature. It is a soup to nuts experience where people will produce videos during the session, but also learn our best techniques coupled with best research, coupled with best practices in order to produce video that people actually learn from and want to watch. Josh, anything you'd add? Cause that's a pretty good summary. It's going to be an experience. Uh, I am over the moon excited about this because I know that those individuals that come show up, they're going to be walking away with the transformational experience. There's going to be information in this, these two days that you can't get anywhere else. I mean, between the three of us, I think we'll add insights. We will uh, put together workflows. We will have actually a really fun time based upon the activities I think that we're putting together. Uh, and so I think the two days is going to go really fast, but you will be a different person on the other side. 
I think what I'm excited about, you know, while only one of us has hair and, and great hair at that, um, all three of mm-hmm. us have, you know, pretty rich experience in this field, but from really different perspectives, different starting points, you know, all of us do educational video, but our strengths are different. Our experiences are different. I think the three of us together really put together, uh, you know, some synergy that's very exciting. And, and, you know, I'm as eager to hear what Matt and Josh have to say as I am to, to teach my portion of, of the workshop. You know, I think I'm going to learn a whole lot as well. I think it's going to be a great experience for everyone who comes and, and, you know, it's in Orlando, so that's not half bad either. Right. Right. Oh, I was going to say something very similar, Mark, that I, I think the thing that I'm excited about, and I hope if you're, you're interested, you'll check it out. And if you can make it work with budgets and timing, all that stuff, that'd be great because I'm excited because I know I go to your guys' sessions already, right? I, when you guys have sessions, I love going to them because I know, even if I've sat through them before, I pick up new tidbits, new ideas, and I, I grow as a video creator by, by listening to what you have to say. And I think being able to, to have this interaction together and have it with around these kind of practical activities that we're going to be doing will give someone a really a great opportunity, not only to, to learn and absorb those things, but to ask questions, to, to push against it a little bit and say like, well, why and how and what can we do? And I think that adds for this really op- opportune, whereas, you know, I, I love doing the podcast. I love teaching for the TechSmith Academy, things like that. But there's not there's not that kind of that two way. Let's let's help each other. And, and I think if you're in the audience, you have that opportunity to make us really push us to, to really be at our best. And I think that will be will be really something special. I, I think, too, what's cool is the way we're designing this is it really works for someone who's never made a video before but is going to who needs to learn the basics of how do i shoot how do i light and someone who's been producing videos but is looking for process in order to optimize what they do and become more efficient at it so i mean i think there's a lot of good reasons and 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 i think we're going to have a range of experience levels in the room which is exciting to me and i think it's going to make it really dynamic yeah and i like that you know we have hands-on too. So, you know, we've talked about doing stations will be an audio station, a light station, a camera station uh, to where you'll be able to get hands on with the equipment and really understand how these things function or just get out your own phone and, and shoot away based upon, you know, some of the um, steps and ideas that we have as far as using that piece of equipment. Yeah, Matt, we should acknowledge beforehand, though, that, that Josh will outdress us. He will. For yeah, I will sure. dress down. We will all be equals. Oh, I'll, I'll wear I'll, my I'll, suit and tie. I, I, need I'll, all, I'll, I need all of you to wear blazers. <laughs> so the only problem with that is first I would have to, you know, own a blazer. <laughs> well, let's, send just, you more. let's give a couple of days. It's so anyone that's looking at this or thinking about this Monday, April 10th and Tuesday, April 11th is the day of the workshop. You can find it through Learning Solutions. We'll link to it in the show notes so you can go out and get all the details. Um, but we'd love to have anyone uh, come and, and register, join us. If you've got questions, email us at the visual lounge at techsmith.com. That's that way I can answer any questions you might have. But I mean, I'm, I'm excited. We don't usually promote things like this on the show, but this is something I was like, it is too good to pass up of an opportunity to let people know. Cause I mean, I, I really think that even if I wasn't doing it, I would want to go to this to, to learn. Cause I know Josh and Mark are so as you've heard already in the podcast, so expert and knowledgeable. It's uh, it's going to be a good time. And lunch is included. And lunch is included. So, <laughs> and Orlando. So, you know, yes. our, for anyone who is okay. in the, the situation I'm in where it's always gray and dreary, it, sunny April weather in Florida sounds pretty good right now. So, well, well, gentlemen, I want to, let's have a, a, a little bit of fun here. I, we've already been having a lot of fun, but I want to go on. We're going to do our speed round questions. So just a reminder, these are quick, short answers. They do not have to be one word answers, but short answers. We've got some dice ready to roll to determine the question. So I'm going to play a little stinger here. Here we go. All right, so uh, I've got multiple dice. Color doesn't really matter, so we're just gonna we're gonna go ahead and roll here. Let's bring up the dice cam. There's got I one there. So, oh wow! I yeah. love that. Okay, so let's go, uh, Josh. You're you're in the middle of the the screen usually, so I'm gonna have you go first. You get question the start number seven. So let's come back over here. Uh, 
you know, Josh, you're, you, you've been an L and D you've done, you've actually been an illustrator. I know you've owned your own company and ran and made videos for, for companies and consulted, but if you had to shift careers and, you know, out of the world of learning and development, you, where he said, you're, you're gone, you're out of here. What would you do? You could do anything, but what would you do? Can I answer that for Josh? Can I give Josh? <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead. Yes. Answer that for me. I cannot wait to hear this. Hit it. Well, I was going to say Shepard. <laughs> that was not even in my top 100. Okay. <laughs> you know, I love to cook. So, and bake and all those things. And I'm heavy into barbecue. So, if I had to like shift gears, I would still be, you know, it's in my blood. I would still be some kind of trainer. I would still want to help people, but I think it'd be how to teach people how to barbecue or something like that. So, something involved with that type of food. So I was going to say pit master. So yeah, I, <laughs> oh, I don't know. I didn't know that, I, I didn't know, I didn't know that was a barbecue thing for a long time. Yeah, it was my, it was my COVID hobby and now it's in my blood. So. <laughs> yeah, and, it, yeah. and in your cholesterol <laughs> and at your cardiologist's <laughs> office, it's a lot of places. It's all moderation. Moderation. All right, Mark, here we go. Dice cam is up. Your okay. dice is rolling. And a number eight. Lucky number eight. <laughs> oh, this is fun. If you had to pick an image that represents you, what would it be? <laughs> How about the image on the right hand side of the screen? <laughs> Um, I, I, I just, I, you know, honestly, I think watch one of my videos cause I am in my videos who I am in real life. So I think the image that I project in an, in a video that where I'm teaching something, that's the real me. Um, you know, so, I mean, I think that's as authentic as you can get is seeing me teach something on camera. I love it. I love it. I was going to say, Josh, do you want to pick an image for him? He picked a career for you as Shepherd. <laughs> Roll the dice, Matt. <laughs> All right. Let, let's next question for Josh. <laughs> also a number eight. Look at that two in a row, Josh. I hope you're thinking during that question. What image would you pick to represent yourself? It would have to be a professor. It would have to be some, somebody, a sage, somebody who transfers knowledge. Cause that's been my whole career. Nice. You know, it is, it is an awkward question. Cause there's a million things. I, my favorite yeah. was, we had some of that. Uh, she I said have just done something left field. Like, like, you know, a she Twinkie. About, she, someone said a type of dog and that it was, it was, right, like, yeah. you know, all right, let's so, do Mark. Well, I, I noticed, I noticed by the, you have multiple 12 sided dice with you. Oh yeah. I've got a handful here. I've got. Don't I've we got, all? Ready. Way too many. All right, Mark. Next question here. And that Six. Is, I know it's or nine. Mean, lying nine. underneath. So it is nine. nine. We, we're just nine. going right down the list here. Okay. So, so Mark, as uh, we talked video producing, you know, kind of secret sauce, uh, asked a few questions, but what's a question we should have asked and talked about today that we didn't get a chance to? Biggest mistakes that Josh and I have made as video producers. Okay. So, so let's go. What, what are those biggest mistakes? Like what's the top? Don't, we don't have to go in too deep detail, but I'm curious. Um, my biggest mistake, kind of in a business mistake, but listening to the online gurus about repurposing content and not realizing that different video channels have different viewer intention. You know, nobody goes on Facebook to learn about uh, Photoshop. No one, but they might go on YouTube to do so. So misunderstanding or believing the hype about reuse of video and not understanding that video has to be in the individual context of the channel where it's being distributed. Yeah, makes makes sense. Josh, what about you? Biggest mistake? Yeah. Actually, this goes back to what Mark was saying. Poor planning. Uh, I've been in too many situations where I'm randomly shooting B-roll and you get back to do the edit and it's just a mess. Uh, or um, forgetting the clapboard or not not doing a, you know, it's all in the planning, whatever the case may be. And so I can just, in my mind, I can think of production situations at a corporation or anything like that. Um, teleprompter wasn't working with 
with C-level executives wait on set, waiting to record, looking at their watches. You talk about sweat. Holy cow. Uh, and that's just because we did not uh, test the teleprompter ahead of time thinking it was going to work. So yeah, test, plan, plan everything. Critical. Here's a mistake that'll save someone out there thousands of dollars if they don't make it. And that's to establish and use and be judicious about a naming convention immediately and follow that naming convention through all phases of production. Because nothing is more expensive than losing footage or mislabeling it and having to have someone watch hours and log hours of footage looking for one thing that you didn't name correctly. So I, I, my, one of my mistakes was not being absolutely precise about a naming convention and losing footage from an instructor who had already flown back across the country. So I, I will add mine here, and it's really two experiences that have kind of add up to this, but these were were painful, uh, both basically being not actually hitting record. So I was in uh, Scotland mm -hmm. and I was interviewing someone and we were in a, a, a football stadium and they were that's where they worked and we're talking and I had a little handheld digital recorder and I. I thought I had hit record, but I had, I'd paused it basically. So it looked like it was recording, but it was paused. And so it was flashing rather than solid. And I didn't know my gear and I didn't know what that meant. And, and we got through and I got back and I was going through footage and I realized I had no audio. I had audio from the camera in this noisy environment that was unsalvageable. And the other one was, I was doing an interview like this with someone from our, our, our senior leadership team. Uh, and she was very, relatively new and doesn't know, didn't know me, doesn't know me. And, uh, we got about 20 minutes into the interview and it was going great. And I realized I had not hit the record button Oof. and I was, I was, I was embarrassed. I, I, you know, I, I could tell that, you know, she was very gracious about it, but I had wasted time and that was kind of a no, no. So I think just <laughs> don't, Make sure you're actually recording, guys. Make sure you're hit, you hit the button. You know your gear. You can you can do it. So you know, there's, there's an author. I think his name. I may be mispronouncing it. Atul Gawande. Who he wrote the Emperor of All Maladies about cancer, and he also wrote another book about that called the Checklist Manifesto. And the power of checklists in video is amazing. You know, airline pilots use checklists for processes that they do three or four times a day. So, you know, there's one less failure point when flying a plane. And I think as video producers, we should be doing the same thing. I'm all about using checklists to prevent, you know, to limit the number of mistakes that you make. You're still going to make them, but checklists are a great tool to prevent that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well, Josh and Mark, thank you so much for, for joining me. Before we go into our final takes, if people, obviously they can come see us at the workshop, but where should they connect with you guys if they want to follow you, get more of your great advice, information? Josh, where should they reach out to you or where should they follow you at? Yeah, uh, joshcavalier.com. And also I post on LinkedIn and occasionally on Instagram, but LinkedIn is really, you're going to find a lot of good stuff there. Perfect. What about you, Mark? DollarDesignSchool.com or just reach out to me at mark at DollarDesignSchool.com. Uh, I'm only really active uh, socially on LinkedIn, so you can find me there. Um, you can just search my name and uh, I should pop up. I'm not the urologist. I'm the other one. And uh, yeah, that's where, I, that's where I post most of my musings and thoughts. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So as we wrap up the show, it's uh, the final take, the chance to kind of summarize any key takeaways that you had today. Mark, let's start our final take with you today. So Mark, what's your final take? Quality matters. People are not comparing your learning or corporate video to the last learning or corporate video that they saw. They're comparing your video content to other media. They're comparing your video content to what they saw on TikTok, to the video they just, to the video game they just played, to the movie they just watched. And we all need to develop the skills for the videos within our venue to stand up against other media that's out there. Otherwise, we're going to turn off viewers and, and we're going to disengage the people who we need to be uh, engaged in what we're doing. So I think quality matters, production quality matters, but all of it can be learned. There's no talent here. Perfect. 
Josh, what's your final take? Uh, my final take is now is your time. If you've been standing on the sidelines waiting to record that first video or get into video production, now is the time because the way that tools are headed, it's going to get easier. The way that the equipment is headed, it's going to get easier. So um, I would challenge your viewers, especially if they're interested in view and they're watching us right now, just get started. Uh, pick a small project, get out there, get your hands dirty uh, with a lot, as Matt mentioned, a lot of free tools are out there at your disposal. And it is the best time, the best time to get in the video. Awesome. Well, Mark Lassoff, Josh Cavalier, thank you so much for joining me here in the Visual Lounge. We will get, we'll see you guys soon. And we hope everyone will join us uh, in Orlando for our upcoming workshop. And, but thank you both. Thanks, Matt. All right, everybody, we appreciate you tuning in. And hopefully, again, the workshop is something that's interesting to you, but hopefully you took away some good ideas about the future video, what some of that secret sauce is. You can tell it's not about the, as Mark said, I love it. It's not about the talent. It's about skills and putting them to work. And as Josh said, we it's our mantra here on the Individual Lounge. We hope you take a little time to level up every single day. And that includes, if you haven't started, go ahead and get started. We'll see you all soon. Thanks.